Hi and welcome back to another video of Circuit Digest. This side it's Ashwant and on the other side today we have Mr. Ryan who is the CEO of a company called Alt Bionics. So Alt Bionics is working on ways to make advanced prosthetic devices affordable for everyone. So Ryan himself started this as a college project when he just graduated and now he is building a company around it. Excited to know what he is doing with it and how he is planning to take this device into the market. Circuit Digest got in touch with him and this is what he has to say. So, hi Ryan, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, Ryan, thank you so much. So, yeah, let's dive into the question straight away. So, let's uh, talk talk about Alt Bionics first. So, what inspired you to start with the field of prosthetic devices, Brian? Yeah, so my sophomore year in college, I still had no idea what electrical engineers actually did. Um, and that's my degree, electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. So I started doing independent research into the different fields of, um, well, I guess, electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. And I found the field of robotics and I simultaneously found how it was applied in prosthetic devices. Mm -hmm. And then I came across a man named Johnny Mathney who had uh, the most advanced bionic arm in the world. Okay. So that was DARPA's funded um, John Hopkins project that was basically $120 million worth of research and development into this bionic arm. And I was just amazed, blown away. I was like, oh my gosh, like we're, we're here in technology. Like I would love to be a part of this. I didn't care anymore what engineers did on a daily basis. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of where it all started. But uh, the biggest thing is probably the cost of those devices that I found out. Mm -hmm. um, I found out that they were anywhere from $10,000 to $150,000. And that was just absurd to me. I was like, that's weird. You know, I've worked with some of these circuits before. I understand the electronic componentry. Um, so yeah, about four or five years ago now, I started learning all that I could about these devices and set up to see if I could build my own for less. So that's kind of where it all started my sophomore year of college. Okay, fine. So that is when it hit you, right? But how did it transform into a company and how did it took off the ground as a company? Yeah, so my sophomore year, like I said, I discovered that and I set up to see if I could build mine for less. So over the next two years, I started doing independent research into electromyography sensors, uh, neuromuscular control, and checking to see if I could find some type of medium or hand um, if to build and prove out this device that could be made for less. Mm -hmm. And so in my final year at university, I found an incredible team who shared the same vision and with them competed in the university's yearly technology symposium or competition. Mm -hmm. And that's where we built an AI enhanced bionic prosthetic device. And it's actually this one right here. Mm -hmm. um, this is an open source design from one of our competitors actually out of the UK, but it helped basically demonstrate what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. So we built this for $600. Okay. It came with um, touch responsive haptic feedback. So when you shook the hand, this little LED on the ring on the back lit up, kind of like a stoplight from green to yellow to red based on the strength. Um, it had AI enhanced electromyography sensors, so it could better detect what the user was trying to do based okay. on neuromuscular signals. Okay. And we got second place at the technology symposium. Oh. Um, which was awesome, right? I mean, we had we had six separate news stations come do stories just on our team. So it was just, it was incredible. Everyone asked us like, what next? Mm -hmm. um, but at that point, it was just a project for us. Okay. Um, it wasn't until I met Ryan Davis through a friend I had in college, um, who's an army ranger. Mm -hmm. he, he, he was in, involved in an IED explosion in Afghanistan about four summers ago now, almost four summers ago now. And he ended up losing his arm um, above the elbow and legs at various heights. And his cousin, Sarah, asked me, hey, could Ryan Davis use your device? And I said, absolutely. That's why we made it. And I brought it over to him. Um, they turned to me and they said, or they asked, uh, what's next? And when a family whose life this affects asks you what's next, it's much different than you know, people at the technology competition asking you what's next. Okay. So it was at that moment that I said, okay, you know, I can definitely help people with this. Mm -hmm. I want to turn this into something more. And yeah, that's, that's where the company started. So six months after that, um, started the company as a sole proprietor. And then it's been a crazy ride from there, but that's where it started. 
Okay, that is interesting. So what you just showed us was your first prototype ever, right? Is it uh, is it right to say that? Was that your first yep. device? So how did you go around with this? Uh, is it all 3D printed? I could see a NeoPixel ring on the back, but are the, yeah. fingers, are the fingers 3D printed? Like what, uh, like how did you get around with it for your first prototype? Yeah, so this is a this is called the Brunel Hand 2.0. It's B-U-B-R-U-N-E-L, uh, Hand 2.0. Um, it's an open source design from Open Bionics based out of the UK. Okay. Um, there aren't many instructions on how to build it, maybe some like assembly instructions, but apart from that, um, not much. But you can figure it out if you work at it long enough. Um, but yeah, they're 3D printed materials. All of the stuff on the front is polyurethane. So it's a type of rubber to simulate um, synthetic skin. Okay. Uh, and then the rest is entirely 3D printed. And you're right, good eye. That is a NeoPixel ring from Adafruit okay. on the back. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was very inexpensive. I think the to- the full hand cost about 30, 40 bucks to make. Okay. And then the motors were another, I think, 210. So okay. total, the hand cost like two, 260, 270 to make. And then um, the AI and all the other componentry that we added in totaled it up to 600. Oh, cool. So, uh, Ryan, so uh, what happened after that? So, I believe right now your uh, first bionic hand is called Genesis. Have you guys uh, figured out a name for that yet? What yeah, so called? that's our that's the name of our first hand that's going to become the okay. market or our, our ideal name that what we what we want to call it. Okay. Um, so, we came up with a name basically because there's no other device like this on the market right now. Mm-hmm. And it's largely because our device is highly accessible and very modular. And okay. that if anyone ever broke it, mm-hmm. you could simply remove a few screws on the backside, take off the dorsal plate or the backside of the hand, and then yep. remove a finger mm-hmm. and then put a new finger back in in the event that it breaks. So our enha- it's one of the first in the market, or it will be one of the first in the market. So we decided Genesis would be a good name. Okay. Um, so it's currently in its, what's the mark is this? This is Mark 37. So this is our most recent version of the hand. Um, you can see it doesn't have the polyurethane. Uh, this one does. This is the first version with the polyurethane on it. Um, we're still experimenting with the urethane molds, but yeah, we're on Mark 38. So we've gone through 38 iterations of these. We okay. redid the NeoPixel, you can see. So it's a more hexagonal shape um, to represent our logo. Okay, cool. But yeah. So what stage is it uh, currently at? Uh, how far are you from getting into the market from here? Yeah, so we're still in research and development. Um, we're hoping to be in markets by the end of this year. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. So Ryan, it should have been a huge transformation, right? Like right from your first prototype to, uh, you know, like 36, 37 iterations so far. So how would you compare it? Like how has your journey evolved from, you know, starting it as a prototype to getting ready for, uh, you know, getting into the market? Yeah, um, I was very lucky. Um, so a short story about the senior design team that I worked with back in college. They were all graduating the semester that we presented at the technology symposium. Um, so they actually couldn't join me because they couldn't wait six months for me to start a startup company that had a high chance of failing. So um, I, I went back to them after the technology symposium and I said, hey, I want to turn this into a startup. Do you all want to join? They all said, no, we can't. We have other prospects lined up. Um, I used my winnings from the technology symposium that we split to buy them out. Uh, that's why I got to keep, wait, no, not that hand. That's why I got to keep this hand. Okay. Um, but yeah, I guess, I, like I said, I was very lucky in that after rebuilding the team, I found, I was originally only looking for one mechanical engineer, mm-hmm. but after about 40 interviews with mechanical engineers, I found two that were just, impossible to pass up. So I asked them like, Hey, would y'all both want to join on Mm -hmm. best decision I ever made probably in my entire life, because they are geniuses like in disguise, your diamonds in the rough and it's amazing. Um, so Sam used to work for fortune 500 companies, um, optimizing manufacturing processes. And he is just a closet genius is what I call him because he has some incredible ideas about this hand. Um, and then Jackson used to work for, for, works for the Air Force Research Lab developing advanced Air Force weapon systems. Mm -hmm. And yeah, um, that's a lot of how the R&D process got started is with them. I said, I want to rebuild this hand. I don't like these things about the Brunel hand, right? It's kind of floppy, like you can bend these fingers. And Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we want more rigidity, more modularity. 
And so those were the first things where we started. And the first prototypes are hilarious to look at looking back now because, yeah, it's just been a crazy process of research development, iteration after iteration, failure after failure. And then now we're at a point where, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a gorgeous looking hand right now. And I have them to thank for it. So Ryan, uh, one of the primary goal of all bionics is to make advanced prosthetic devices for an affordable price, right? So how does the company plan on doing it? Like what are the areas in which one can particularly reduce cost in a prosthetic device? Yeah, so that's a really good question. One we get all the time. Um, so there's a couple of reasons for this. And the first is that we use 3D printed technologies to do this. So our hands can be entirely 3D printed from scratch, um, whether on an FDM printer or otherwise. But we use a special type of 3D printing uh, called multi-jet fusion manufacturing or 3D printing. It uses a type of nylon composite. So I always compare it as the next best thing to carbon fiber. Um, it's, it's just extremely robust, extremely rigid, and we just love it so much. Like you can see, um, there aren't any like striation lines on this hand. It's it's it almost looks injection molded injection molding, right yep so that's one of the big things of how we make this so affordable um additionally we i guess i mean yeah we're still using the same type of molding process so we use a urethane to mimic synthetic skin um i feel like i should have a better answer for that i'm trying to i'm trying to to balance what's in the patent and what's not so i, I don't like completely give away like why we're such a special company but um the biggest thing is 3d printing and i think that should kind of make it obvious, right? Because if you don't have injection molding processes, you're not going to be having these large, like thousand dollar to hundred thousand dollar costs of that tooling process. And yeah, so I'd say 3D printing is the biggest one that I can actually talk about right now. <laughs> right. So another thing is the bionic hand from all bionics uses artificial intelligence to learn about the different wrist patterns of a uh, of a patient, right? So can you tell us more on how AI is being used in prosthetics here? Yeah, and give me a second, I'll take my jacket off to get a little hot, but this will also help because I have kind of an example. Okay. Um, so we worked with a prosthetic and orthotic clinic to develop this EMG cuff for me. Mm -hmm. um, you can see the EMG sensors in there, though those detect the electrochemical signals that your brain sends to your muscles anytime you wanna move them. Mm -hmm. um, and so as I put this on, those EMG sensors inside will make contact with my wrist. And you can see these little windows right here have the EMG sensors in them. And so we take in those signals, which range from like 40 millivolts to negative 70 millivolts. Mm -hmm. And then we do a lot of processing, signal processing on them through our controllers. And then that signal is turned into a five volt signal, which varies from zero to five volts based on the intensity. So the way we use AI is that we take these signals and we ask whoever's going to use the device to make like a hand motion of something they want to do. So if I said, okay, make a grip and this AI would be recording for like 10 seconds, this grip. And so after a certain set of, after a certain number of data points, it would understand that, okay, whenever those signals went into the controller, mm -hmm. it would say, okay, I, re I remember that that is a grip. So it's going to be doing a grip. Right. So that's how we use AI to determine what the user is trying to do. It's a bit of a training process. Mm -hmm. um, I might say a bit, but it's only like 10 to 20 minutes of training. And then you're able to use the hand very competently. I won't say perfectly. It's obviously they're going to use grip patterns. So you're going to have different grips and mm -hmm. all of these things. But um, yeah, that's how the AI works. Okay, fine. Right. One thing here is, you know, bionic hands or prosthetics, advanced prosthetics altogether is uh, still a naive market till date. You know, like there are not much companies working on uh, this domain. So when you started your venture, what were the technical challenges that you faced when you were trying to build a medical grade prosthetic device? Yeah. Um, yeah. In the U.S., it's not a very saturated market at least for transradial bionic hands um but there are a lot in the world actually i think there's somewhere close to 15 or 20 actually okay. and they're all bionic hands but their price costs range from i think the lowest recorded is eight thousand, okay. and the highest recorded is like two hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. 
So um, we'll be the first to do this, but the biggest technical challenge that we've had in you know turning a school project into a medical device is, um, let's see, I guess it probably has to be FDA. I mean, wh whatever country's um, medical regulatory system is there is going to be the most limiting factor in getting this thing to market because some are going to want clinical trials, some are going to want you to prove out that you know, these are subject to design controls and like built with a quality management system in place. And, um, but yeah, that's the biggest technical challenge. Uh, like I said, I've been very lucky with my engineers. They can solve any problem you throw at them. I say, we need to make the thumb move in all directions. They're like, okay, here's how we're going to do it. Uh, but yeah, I'd say the regulatory system is the biggest technical challenge that we have. Okay. So uh, Ryan, right now you're still in R&D, as you told, and you're uh, almost ready with finalizing your product. So what now, what after this, like, what is your go-to market strategy for your uh, bionic hands? Yeah, so we'll begin by selling these and partnering with prosthetic and orthotic clinics. Mm -hmm. um, you could buy these as an amputee on your own, but again, these prosthetic sockets are what we interface with. And okay. so... Um, the hand needs some type of system and we don't sell that. So we, we're going to partner with prosthetic and orthotic clinics so that we can have them attach the hand to this socket system that they make for the amputee or person with congenital difference. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's a pretty straightforward market strategy. I mean, the prosthetic and orthotic clinics buy these from manufacturers like us and then they sell them to the amputee and then those are reimbursed under um, L codes from insurance companies, at least in the US. Um, so sometimes they can re be reimbursed for the full cost. Mm -hmm. So ours could effectively be a zero cost to the amputee mm -hmm. and others most likely not. So there's still gonna be like a charge uh, for others bionic hands on the market uh, just cause they're so expensive. But yeah, pretty straightforward strategy. Um, not too many hindrances in there. Um, yeah. Right. So from an amputee's point of view, how does this whole thing work? Let's say I need this prosthetic device, I purchase it, uh, probably there's going to be some uh, training phase associated with it. But what after that, like, is it like a single time purchase and is it done or what is it actually like? Yeah, so that's a good question. I haven't been asked that before. That's surprising. Um, so after, after you go through an amputation, um, you will talk to your doctor, right? After you're healed up and everything's, I guess, as healed as it can be, you go to your doctor and say, hey, I want a bionic hand or I want a prosthetic device. Right. And your doctor will then refer you. And this is strictly for the US. I'm not sure how it works to other countries yet. Um, I'm assuming, assuming it's the same in the EU, but your doctor will refer you to a prosthetic and orthotic clinic. Okay. And that is where they will start um, testing your residuum to see if you have enough um, I guess, electrical, electrochemical muscular activity um, or action potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fidelity to uh, be able to use a myoelectric device or a bionic device. And if you don't, they'll probably offer you a solution that is non-myoelectric. So a mechanical device that you move with like attached to your shoulder and it'll close based on that movement. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, your doctors will give you the option or your prosthetist will give you the option of, hey, here is the... Um, Autobach ILM, or here is the Osser ILM, or here is the, uh, what's the other one? Here's the Tasca hand, or like, they'll give you all the options of the hands in the market. And then it's up to you to make the decision of which is best. And sometimes I believe the prosthetist will even refer, like, yeah, refer a specific hand due to its success in the market. Like amputees are saying, this is amazing. This has helped my life a lot. Um, but yeah, uh, most prosthetic devices have a three or two to five year lifespan uh, before they need to undergo either severe repairs or complete replacement. And that's the coolest thing about ours because we have these modular finger sets. So what you see here is a complete finger replacement. So if a finger were ever to break, you would pop one out from a hand, pop this thing back in, put the plate back on and you're good to go again. So we're trying to increase uh, the lifespan of these devices by doing that. But from start to finish, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. That's the lifespan of a hand. And then the training process, like I said, is just a, you click a button on your smartphone through Bluetooth, it trains it, and then you're good to go. All right. So Ryan, I have one more 
personal question from my side obviously you can you know like uh, reveal as much information as you could possibly reveal but i am very curious to know how actually that bionic hand works like what are the possible wrist action it can make how many actuators do you have here what is its potential degree of freedom what is the battery you are using how long will it last like how much of this information will you be able to share um i mean i can share a lot yeah we we have a patent over this and the patent are for these like very specific things of our device it's a utility patent not so much design patent um but yeah i guess i can kind of go through it so every finger has a motor with it so you can have individual motion of a hand um or individual motion of each finger and the thumb the thumb has i believe four degrees of freedom so it has um abduction and adduction as well as flexion and extension uh, the fingers have flexion and extension. Uh, the wrist is fixed, but there are options out there that we can include uh, for an adaptive wrist that can rotate. Um, I don't think it could perform flexion and extension, but I know it could probably it could definitely rotate around its axes. Um, and then, yeah, so the grip patterns, they're, I'm pretty sure it's the same everywhere, but there are six primary grip patterns that are classified as the, I, I guess, the essential grip patterns uh, for daily living. And they're called activities of daily living um, grip patterns, basically. They're called ADLs. And one is called the pinch. Um, another is called a three-jaw chuck. Um, there's going to be a key grip. So if you need to put like a key in your hand, um, there is then the, like if you're picking up grocery bags, I forget what it's called. Um, uh, and then a power grip. So it's like a fist. So if you're gripping something very tight, like a pole, and then there's the sixth one that I can never remember, but those grip patterns will come standard with our device. And then through the smartphone app, you can program other ones as well. We'll have like some pre-programmed in there that you can just select and swap out. Uh, but yeah, you can, we've designed it to where you could just from a simple slider. So as like, I push one slider down, this finger is going to go down. And as I push the other slider down, the other finger will go down. So you can make these as specific, customized as you want. But yeah, those are, I guess, the main features of it. And then we also have four sensors embedded within the fingertips here. Sensors. Correct. Yeah. So the four sensors are going to be embedded in both the index, middle, and palmar areas. And those will be proportionally mapped to the LED ring on the back. So as you push down on something, You'll see that LED ring light up with a proportional, um, it's hard to proportion light and force, but that light will start at green, go to yellow and go all the way to red based on how hard you are pushing on something or how hard something is interacting with the hand. Um, I have a video out there of me shaking this hand um, and it, this will light up. And as you're shaking it, like you're actually shaking a hand, like meeting someone, it will light up. And that's kind of um, a neat thing that we added because you don't really know like how this hand that has no nervous system in our interface um, is reacting or interacting with the environment. So we thought that would be a good thing. Um, it's also going to interface with vibration motors that will vibrate at a proportional force of that as well. So two modes of haptic and visual feedback or two modes of feedback, which is haptic and visual. Yeah. And the last thing was about the power source. Like how do you manage to power this entire setup? Yeah, so there are medical grade options on the market that have been approved uh, for use. We're not selling our own. We're going to re recommend uh, battery systems to work with. Um, I think we're using one from Steeper right now. I think it's like, a, I forget the milliamp hours, but they're, they're pretty beefy batteries. And I think right now from a 2200 milliamp hour battery, we were able to get seven to eight hours of battery life and it was still at its full charge. Um, so it, we managed to pull out some pretty incredible, um, uh, battery life from this, but yeah. So we're looking at like between eight and 16 hours of battery life. Okay. So Ryan, uh, when I looked into your website, one thing that I found was you have a separate wing called bionics engineering, which plans to help college and high school students to learn more about medical devices. So can you tell us more about it? Like, why did you start this and what are you planning with this? Yeah. So when I started this, when I started doing independent research, it wasn't easy. 
And it was an extremely big challenge to find like the brunel hand to put the brunel hand together. There weren't many good resources on like molding the urethane. So it was, it was a challenge. I mean, it took me a whole year to make one hand. I could probably put this together in like two hours now because I know how to do it, but it wasn't easily accessible to understand the, intri the intricacies of building a myoelectric bionic hand. And it doesn't need to be because there are, there are all of these available tools and resources online. There's just no good place to find it all. Um, like there's great resources for finding bionic hand solutions if you're an amputee, but if you want to learn about it, then, I mean, if you want to learn about it and like help the field as an engineer, because there are tons of biomedical engineers who have emailed me and said like, Hey, I want to learn more about this. I want to work with you. Like I'll do anything. I'll get you coffee. I just want to be a part of this. And I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I can't, but um, that's kind of where it started. Uh, and additionally, we, when I was making this hand, I was recording the videos for it on how to make it. Um, just because I like, I guess, documenting what I do in engineering and I posted it to TikTok, and it, it actually went terribly viral. Um, it has like 16 million views, 3 million likes. And we had, I think a total of 860,000 followers now. And from there, we also found out that tons of people want to learn about this, but they don't know how. And they asked me, Hey, how can someone in high school start learning about this? Or how can someone in middle school even can start learning about this? And I'm like, oh gosh, like I, I gave them all the resources, but it's scattered, right? You have like to have 18 tabs open and like bounce between. So I decided that I would love to have a page on our website where people can just click on bionics engineering and start this like scroll down page of like, okay, either YouTube videos, some type of infographic or reading and then kind of understand bionic prosthetics from the ground up. Um, but yeah, we're still working on that. Uh, our biggest focus right now is getting these out to market so we can help as many people as possible because these are unaffordable right now. And after that, yeah, we'll, we'll start definitely start on that bionics engineering page. Okay, cool. So Ryan, that's it. I'm done with most of my questions, almost all my questions here. And to be frank, I'm really curious to see your product out there and see how it performs. So uh, yeah, do you have anything else to add up to this interview? Um, I mean, the biggest thing, I mean, one of my biggest missions is to try and help inspire people to get into this field. So if you have any questions and you're watching this, please feel free to email me at altbionics at gmail.com. That's the one I check for, um, that's associated with like all our social media and everything. Um, I never don't respond to something either on Instagram or on my email. Um, I keep a zero inbox, so I promise I will always reply. So if you ever have any questions, um, just let me know. Even if you need some inspiration for electrical engineering degree, just feel free to message me. That is really, really great. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of emails after this. So guys, so that is the email ID. It's altbionics at gmail.com. We'll also put that in the description just to make sure you're getting it right. So uh, that's it, Ryan. Thank you so much for your time. Despite your busy schedule, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and your progress with Altbionics. So...